Okay, good morning, everybody. Can you all hear us? It's a, there's a little bit of echo in the front, so I can hear myself. Yeah. Which but they I, say it's better in the middle. It is? Yeah, well, that's, that's what he said. It's always better you in the middle. You should try right? and listen to people, right? <laughs> so, okay, so we're going to talk today about this uh, new software development methodology that we've created. Um, take in the worst parts of almost every software development methodology we've seen in the past. Right? So uh, it's going to be a mix of anti-patterns and even more anti-patterns, basically. Um, so let us let quickly, quickly start. Um, I'll start by introducing myself, basically, if my pointer works. Ah, there I am. Oh, this is a really big picture. I'm basically a dad. I have three kids, of which two and a half live with me full time. Um, and in my spare time, I'm basically a coach, a trainer, a programmer. Uh, I've been writing code since I was 14, so that's like 120 years. Um, I do speak a bit, I write a bit, I'm writing a new book, and I travel a bit, that's why we're here. Um, in my current role, I'm basically a chief architect for an IoT uh, company that is cloud, uh, cloud native, um, and I help them to write better code. Um, and before that, I used to work for this small company called Capgemini. They're basically everywhere, it's sort of like a virus. Um, and this is my website, and um, that's enough, Brad. I think so. Oh. So I'm Kim. A lot of echo. <laughs> and um, I've been in management a lot of years, um, and I didn't really like it anymore because I really want to be part of the team, be more uh, busy with uh, the code itself and with IT itself. So I moved um, this year to another company where there are no managers. Uh, it's an outsourcing company where you do mission-critical software um, for big banks, big government institutions, stuff like that, and you get everybody's responsible, so everybody can do anything they think that is important for the customer, and that's really cool. So basically, I have two kids, and um, yeah, we travel a lot together, right, to get away from all the five kids we have together, so <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So let's start off. We're going to start off with a short history of software development methodologies. And there's quite a few over the years. So you have to imagine, if you're old, like me, looking at, looking at, you're all younger than I am, I guess, right? Is anybody of you over 50, if you dare to say? Oh, right, we're the old guys. Did you also start with a Commodore 64? No, oh, I had one. Oh, cool. <laughs> so. Let's start off with a short history of methodologies. So before 1970, there were actually no methodologies. So if you were producing code before 1970, there was no approach for doing that. But in 1970, there was this nice guy called Winston Royce. And Winston Royce wrote a white paper. Now the white paper is called Managing the Development of Large Software Systems. And it is actually a really, really good white paper. In that particular white paper, there is a picture you probably all know, and it's this one. Do you recognize this? Is there anybody who doesn't recognize this? This is the way we've been doing software development for 50 years now, right? And it's wrong. And the funny thing is, so there's lots of stuff wrong with Waterfall, right? It is, it is a one-off-staged a one -off -staged, uh, uh, methodology, which basically says you only start testing, for instance, once you've done all the coding. And you only start coding once you've done all the analysis. Now, that basically means if anything changes along the way in your project, you're doomed. Because this approach does not incorporate change. Now, what happened with the white paper is that many people read it in the 70s, and many people based their software development methodologies on this particular picture saying, oh, you can only start coding once you've done all the design. And you can only put it in operations once you've done all the testing. Now, if they would have read the white paper better, they would have seen that there's another picture in the white paper, and it's this one. See the difference? I'll do it again. It's just, before, just because it's a cool animation, right? See? There's all these little arrows that go back. Going back means that and he actually says this in the white paper, that if there is a change, you should be able to go back to the previous stage, or maybe even two stages back, adapt, and go back again. So instead of he being the father of Waterfile, Winston Roy should actually have been the great-grandfather of Agile. Right? And even if you read this quote from the white paper, I'll read it out loud, it says, um, note that it is simply the entire process done in miniature to a time scale that is relatively small with respect to the overall effort. He basically says, 
don't do this one-off approach. He literally says that in 1970 already. But make it a stage and do it in very short periods of time. Now that basically means agile. So he already sort of invented agile in 1970, right? I was three years old back then. But we didn't do it because nobody read the white paper right. That's kind of weird, right? That's the most expensive mistake we've ever made in this industry. Well, um, probably outside of inventing null, but inventing null was an even more expensive mistake, right? So, then we went on into Agile. Now, who of you is in an Agile project? Oh, that's about half of you, right? So, let's see if we can find an Agile picture. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> different stuff. So, you all recognize this picture, right? It's in every textbook. Everybody's seen this picture. Is anybody of you a certified Scrum Master or a professional Scrum Master? Oh, only a few. That's good. Um, so there's still lots of money to make for Scrum certification in this country, right? So this is basically Scrum. Now, what happened over time is that in 2001, people sat together and wrote down a lot of stuff about Agile. They wrote the Agile Manifesto. And then it basically came together uh, a number of these people that were in the Agile communities, and they named it Agile in 2001. From there, Scrum became by far the more popular approach of all of them. But the thing is, it's much more than just doing Scrum, right? It's about a mindset. It's about the ideas. It's about working together. It's about learning all the time. Now, that we seem to have forgotten. And what you see is that people started using Agile for basically everything, for changing the world, for instance. Agile wasn't meant to change the world. Agile was originally meant to make us better programmers, to write better code. And hence, it was not intended to change the world, right? And then um, some of the original signees of the manifesto said, well, basically, Agile is dead, right? They, started f they stopped following it because it went in all sorts of weird directions. And I go to Agile conferences every now and then. And if I go to Agile conferences, there's usually quotes like this, like, make sure you don't miss the Agile elephant versus the waterfall elephant in the lobby. What is that? I have no clue what this means, or during this session, <coughs> we are going to discuss the happiness index. What? Are we going to write code? Or, or add ready for celebration before the done column on your Kanban board. Why? I don't get this, right? It's just not, this has nothing to do with Agile anymore, what we intended it for. And then our good friend Ellen says, more and more, I come in to see the term Agile as both unnecessary and self-defeating. Agile has come to mean do part of Scrum badly and use Jira. Now that's where we got right. That is the point where we are right now. So. Yes, so we thought, well, um, maybe it's time to reclaim uh, a methodology, something that we can actually write code with again. Um, and also because we found that Agile has one very big purpose, and that's making a lot of money. Um, so uh, we were kind of worried that Agile might make us less money. We see a lot of people bashing it lately, like this guy, right? Oh, sorry. So <laughs> um, we thought we are, we are going to try something new, and we're going to call it Flow, basically because we want to make more money. And if we want to make as much money as we can, then we need the methodology to be even less efficient than Agile. And, um, well, we were lucky because there's a lot of inspiration in the current methodology, so we will come into that later. But first, we need a name. So, um, uh, giving things names is very difficult, right? <laughs> we know this. Yes. Um, so, we first thought, okay, we definitely need some, some Japanese words like Kaizen, Kanban, uh, Obeya, and Origami, which is the art of uh, tearing out post-its, right? So, um, and we also need to end it with crussy, so something like holacracy, sociocracy, idiocracy, maybe. Um, oh, great movie. And basically, it also needs to end with a D after something continuous. So we're going to name it continuous discovery, dis dis continuous disappointment, maybe, oh, or continuous disagreement. So, um, but on the other hand, we thought maybe more hashtag no and maybe more less or less yes, I don't know. Uh, so no ups, no projects, no estimates, uh, maybe something like no SQL, which is also nice. No testing, no code, um, serverless, pointless. 
<laughs> so there's a lot of well, inspiration. We're getting there. We're getting yeah, there. we're getting there. Or maybe we want it as a service. Ah. So we have SaaS, we have EaaS, we have PaaS. Uh, we also have testing as a service. Really? We also have X as a service, which actually means services as a service. Wow. Oh, everything cool. as a service. Everything as a service. And um, we even have a SaaS team, right? Um, and so we thought maybe mass, mythology as a service. Uh, that would be cool. But in the end, we thought, no, we'll just name it Flow because it really fits nicely to stickers. Uh, and that's also very important. So we thought this is like the basic sticker. If you just start reaching flow and you're on maturity level one, you can use this sticker, right? And then if you, if you proceed, you can go with the flow. That's more than, than you do, don't do flow, you are flow, right? So that's better. And then you go beyond and you go to the hipster stickers, like go with the flow, but then in the hipster variant. And after that, you can feel the flow. This is even more better. And then you can surrender to the flow. And in the end, it's all because of this, cash flow. <laughs> yeah, that's only if you're certified, right? Then yeah. you can have this one. That's, a, that's our sticker. <laughs> so then we thought about, so what should we put in it? So definitely we want to keep sprints, right? Because sprints always work, right? They do? Has anybody of you have seen a failing sprint? <laughs> what is a failing sprint anyway? So sprints are a very nice mechanism to actually help us fail in our projects, right? Because basically sprints have become these mini projects at which you start planning at the start, get it all wrong, and then you do some work, and in the end of the sprint, you always have some work left, right? Now this is from a project in, uh, in Brussels. Sorry, Stefan, it's Belgium. It's, uh, <laughs> and um, what you see here is, oh, they planned it. Oh, I have this nice pointer, right? I can use it basically, oh, it's here. Um, so they planned all this work here at the sprint. I don't know how to do this. And then there's this nice line that says, well, at the end of the sprint, you should be there. And they had some work left. So the next month, what happened is this. I'll show you the third one, but you can already guess, right? It's this. So they had even more work remaining after the sprint. Now, usually what happens is that project managers in these projects will say, oh, you're terrible at estimation. We are, basically, by the way, in this industry, because we don't know how to do that. Um, so we should estimate the hell out of it, right? And then the next sprint, oh, it went wrong again. And the next sprint, it went wrong again. You know what happened in this project? The project manager said, you're awful, guys. I'm going to fire all of you. And he did. And then he hired 300 developers from India. Actually, he actually did. And it made the project even worse, by the way. So if there's one element we should keep, and there's one more, I guess, but there's one element we should keep in this new failing methodology, it will be sprints, right? There need to be sprints in there, do they? Definitely, cool. yeah. Um, so, uh, because then they ask us as consultants, right, to fix the sprints. Yes. And we also need gamification. Oh, yeah. Because then everybody from outside the industry can also join because everybody understands games, right? Yay! So basically, um, when you're a manager, and I was for like 13 years or something, it's really shameful to say. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, Could you repeat that? <laughs> it's really shameful to say. No, that you were um, a manager. Yeah, for many years. So basically, when you're a manager and there's this whole company asking for autonomy, that's really threatening. Because you have this position, you have, you're sitting on top of the knowledge mountain, right? And then all these people say, we can decide for ourselves. So what am I going to do, right? So basically, what you'll say is, okay, we want autonomy, because this is really something everybody's asking for, but they don't get it's to hip, hire right? people. It's and hip. Yeah, it's hipster. So it's good for recruitment. Um, so we can say it's self-organization, but without people hiring. Because, well, basically they never did it, so they don't know how to do it, right? And also without people firing each other, because, yeah, basically they don't know how to do it. Yeah, what a surprise if they never did it, right? Um, and they don't get to do appraisals, because people will be so positive about each other. Um, and they don't get to decide what to work on, because they don't own the product. They can only build the product. And they also don't get to spend any money. So what so, do we get to do then? Yeah. Um, well, well, basically, we will decide what's on the backlog. We will decide who is on which team. We will decide what tools they are using um, because we know how you can do your work best, right? And also, we decide when you have meetings. So what you get to do is you get to um, decorate the working space. <laughs> 
Um, this yeah. is real, by the way. This is not. This is not a joke. This is a real workspace. This is this is the workspace of Zeppos. And actually, this is what people do. They get to decorate the working space. They get to play ping pong. This is me at a job interview for a very, very big kind of Amazon company in the Netherlands. And I was in this ball pit um, doing a job interview, which was really uncomfortable. <laughs> I was so happy I wasn't wearing a dress that day. <laughs> you didn't get hired, I guess, right? No. <laughs> oh, oh, no surprise. <laughs> so. Um, uh, yes, we definitely are going to play games, and we're going to do that for 20% of our days. And um, we're going to have a BYOC policy, bring your own controller, because yes. otherwise it won't be able to manage it anymore, right? So, uh, yeah, definitely. So what else? What else? Well, um, teams? Roles. Oh, we need to talk about roles, right? Roles is good. So, um, yeah. Well, you all recognize this, right? This is a stand-up meeting, right? This is where everybody stands together and talks about what they've done, and et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you look at teams in agile projects, they are usually quite small, right? They're usually a bit like this. This is Kim, by the way, on the back. And um, this is typically uh, a scrum team, right? It has like nine people in it. So usually scrum teams have somewhere between three and nine people in it. And you can recognize there's still a project manager because that's the guy wearing a suit. Um, he wasn't allowed to talk, by the way, so that was good. So anyway, so um, and we, we moved him to farther, farther in the corner every, every week. And in the end, he was totally in the corner of a very big room, just creating Excel spreadsheets as they should, right? And, um, and we did all the work, of course. So, but teams are really, really small. So if you look at Scrum, for instance, there's not a lot of roles defined. There is basically the product owner. We'll talk about that. And there's the Scrum master. Uh, scrum master of the universe, basically. And then there's the developers. Basically, everybody's a developer in Scrum. But that is not in all of these agile approaches. If you look at the more enterprise agile approaches, and we'll talk about that too, right? And um, they have lots more roles. For instance, there's this approach called disciplined agile delivery. I like the word disciplined in it because that's really thorough, right? If you look at the roles they have, it's a bit like this. Can you imagine trying to become agile with a team as big as this? With all these people in there? It's terrible, right? So yes, if we want to create this new methodology, it, used, it needs to have lots and lots of roles. And then there's this other approach called SAFE. Have you heard of SAFE? Who of you is implementing SAFE somewhere? Don't do it. Don't, don't even go there, right? I like SAFE. I, I, we'll do our annual SAFE quiz with you. And um, that is, please, I'm going to show you what safe looks like. And do you have to figure out where the customer is in this picture? Now, here's the picture. Can you find it? It is there, right? It's the person on the left side here who's being hit by the train. <laughs> so, so we have to do something with a customer. It's not that really important. but And then we talk about, well, Looking from a manager perspective, all these people and these roles, and if you look at the previous speak, too many roles, managers usually don't know how to remember this. So we, they came up with a new word, and we thought, you know what, if we're not going to do roles at all, at least we're going to be called resource. Because we've been called resource for 50 years already in this field. I usually ask if people say, oh, um, can we have some more resources? Then I say, what do you mean, more chairs, computers, desks? What do you mean? I said, well, you guys, Osa, you mean people. But in Flow, we're just going to name everybody a resource. Uh, by the way, if you want to become a resource in Flow, you will need to grow a beard, right? It's mandatory to have a beard if you want to work in a Flow pro. That also goes for the women, by the way. <laughs> right? Um, and then there's oh, oh, agile coaches. I have to talk about it. Who of you is an agile coach? I sort of am, but uh, I'm afraid to admit it. So what I've seen happening in this field is that this agile coaching thing is going way too far. They now have like their own weekends where they sit together and agile coach agile coaches. It's about coaches who coach the coaches who coach the coaches who coach the coaches and train the trainers, etc. It's going way off, right? They have this their own agile coaching camps. I have no clue what people do that, by the way. I don't want to know. Or Agile Leadership Weekends. What? We're just there to help people write better code, right? Most of the coaches out there, they, they, these days, they don't even know what coding is. 
That's just terrible. They go into events like this, like the uh, Obeya Knowledge Network meetup in Amsterdam. I have no clue what people do there, right? Or they do, um, uh, this is organized by a friend of mine, by the way, but um, Play 14. What do they do? The agile coaches sit together, play games for a day, and then they go home and they learn something? They do that, right? You just, yeah. I guess they do. I have no clue, basically. I'm not allowed to go there because I usually bash people and stuff like that. Or like this, nice weather, great lunch, awesome location. Well, that's here too, right? Big group, energetic participants, interesting discussion. Day one was packed with learning moments, games, and exercises to help understand the essence. What essence? That we were writing code? Well, it's the essence of flow, basically. This is not one of my tweets, actually. So. And then there's all the exercises that people have, right? This looks like elementary school exercises. And there's lots of them, like improv prototyping. What? Or a celebrity interview, or panarchy. Uh, probably a Greek word, I don't know, but... Uh, or social network webbing. This actually exists. This is not fantasy, guys. It's called liberating structures. And the only question I have with all of these things is, where's the code? <laughs> we were in this field to write better code, right? Not about, well, all this fluffiness that's going around, right? So, yes, um, I needed to say that. Just <laughs> I, know, I, I heard, like, coding is only 10% of time these what? days, right? I, it's actually been investigated. But anyway, when we write code, we want to be in a team. So we need to think about how to organize our teams. So the main question is, are we going to keep DevOps? And we're definitely <coughs> going to keep DevOps. Because it's acronyms, and it's short, and it's really nice to write down in a Twitter message, right? And nobody so, knows what it is, right? Yeah. So we're definitely going to keep it. But um, we are going to discuss on which order. Because there's a lot of discussions on, should it be ops dev or should it be DevOps? Because op ops dev means that you are front-loading ops considerations re relating to applications, operability, security, skill, etc. early in the process. Boring. So um, <coughs> basically, the question becomes, who's more important, ops or dev? And what order are we going to take, right? Um, so, and even then the security guys come in and they argue that it should be sec dev, sec ops, sec, or maybe on the other order, sec ops, sec dev sec or something well basically because um, this guy says well maybe I'm taking it to literally well maybe really? Really? <laughs> just maybe um, but what we need is sec dev sec op sec because um, security must be there at the beginning of the project it must be there in the middle and it should also be there at the end and also there should be some dev and ops somewhere in between of the middle um, and, well, if you just look at who's the founder, it's um, uh, Patrick de Bois, also Belgian, right? And he Again, yep. said um, he wanted to do a system administrators conference, and he wanted to actually name it that way, but that literally did not fit into a sticker or a brochure, so he needed another name. And that's the only reason or reasoning behind the word DevOps. He needed a word for naming a conference. That's what he literally says. So it's really cool that we take it this far to actually have a discussion about the so order. So it actually doesn't mean anything? No, there was never a grand plan for DevOps as a word. So wow. that's really cool. If we can spend so much time on discussing the order, then we're definitely going to keep it. So um, in Flow's collaboration model, um, we are thinking we want the community on board, not only the business, because the community is broader, right? And we want development, we want operations. We also want analysts, because we do really think that we should think a little bit more before we start. And we want security in the end. Eventual security would be definitely the thing. So come DevOps anal sex. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but it was a bit lengthy, so we're going to stick it, was it, it was too long. to rest. <laughs> and we also got a lot of emotional reactions to the previous name. So really? yeah, Yeah, definitely. Why? <laughs> Somehow people had images. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, terrible. Um, well, let's talk about the next big thing that we need to have, right? We need to have meetings. You all like meetings, right? Who likes meetings? <laughs> Only you. <laughs> So you can have meetings on your own then, I guess, right? It's like <laughs> we actually found the guy who likes meetings. Yeah, we, we found him. Let's take him home. <laughs> yeah.
We're going to put him on a shelf in, a, in where we work, right? That's like pretty cool. Anyway, so yes, meetings. There's lots of meetings, right? And we all love meetings. So let's take care. Let, let's have a look at some typical agile meetings that are out there. Who of you does stand-up meetings or daily scrums, right? They're pretty good, right? Because you get to know what everybody's doing, what everybody did yesterday, what they're doing today. By the way, I've been in, so I was one of the first actually to do Agile in the Netherlands, so that's like 20 years or so, and um, I've been in stand-up meetings for 20 years. I can tell you, if you've done them for 20 years, they're actually extremely boring, because they're the same every day. It's the same ugly people you meet every day, and they haven't moved on since yesterday, and they will not move on for the next three weeks. Oh, they're always saying like, um, yes, I'm really busy with blah, 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 blah. They're always busy, right? Nobody ever says, I just finished this and this. Because nobody seems to finish anything anyway these days. Anyway, so yes, um, um, they're good, right? So the good thing is, they break flow. The bad thing is, they are useful. They are extremely useful in exchanging in a very short manner what you're doing and what you're planning to do today and which problems you have. The only thing is, most managers don't really like to have these meetings every day. We actually tried to move a management team with the CEO and the chief strategy officer and the chief into stand-up meetings too, right? And they were like, no, 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 we're gonna have these weekly um, progress meetings that will take uh, at least, well, they took the whole day, right, at the company we worked. Yeah. They, they, they actually sat in a room the whole day, and I was the CTO there, and I was like, what are you guys doing? And I said, well, you have to be there too, because this is, you're in the management team. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to be in a meeting the whole day. It took the whole day. They didn't make any decisions whatsoever, right? So I thought, well, if we do stand-ups right, we have to do that too. So for stand-ups in flow, we said about this. We said, we're going to do it only once a week. That's more than enough for these people to meet each other, right? Um, and we'll do it in one hour instead of 10 minutes. And that will be from 9 to 1 every Tuesday morning. Sort of, right? Doesn't it make sense? It does, <laughs> right? No? Oh, sorry. So anyway, then we move to retrospectives. Do you like retrospectives? Do you have them? Who has them? Oh, good, good. Yes, they're very useful because this is the point in time on agile approaches, on any agile project, that you learn from what you're doing. That means you should look into the stuff that you've done okay, the stuff that you could do better, and you can improve on that in the next sprint, right? That is what they are intended for. So if you take retrospectives out, there's no learning. Now, that is a good idea. If you want a failing methodology, stop learning. So you actually should really remove those retrospectives. Or, on the other hand, maybe we can have more. So what if we do these, like, every week for two hours? And we can discuss forever about how we can go faster, how we should have gone faster, and what we should do better but never do, and stuff like that, right? So we do them more regularly and discuss longer. Because who doesn't like discussions, right? And of course, we never follow up on them. Um, and by the way, um, it's mandatory to have a Lego reference in all of your slide decks if you do. Um, just because we can, right? So, um, but. If you look at actual flow, if you look at what we programmers do, this is highly complex work, right? As Edgar Dijkstra, the famous um, computer scientist, said, well, it's too complex to fit in a single person's mind. So that means we cannot write code on our own these days anymore. It's becoming too complex. You need a whole team. And you need to be able to focus. Now, this is what happens. There's a lot of research being done on programs getting into flow and it takes you about 10 to 15 minutes to get back in flow if you've been disrupted so if you want your projects to fail you should really be disrupted all the time so that is why in flow we came up with a random meeting right every day or every week we organize a random meeting at a random time on a random day about a random subject just because it breaks people's flow. And that means they will lose a lot of time, right? They will. Sounds, sounds a bit like Greek planning, right? <laughs> oh, yes, it does. <laughs> That's good. Um, so, and we also thought we need flow in the enterprise oh, yeah. uh, because that's where the real money is, right? So definitely, we're going to take this big skill. So, um, well, Agile, is it the same as Scrum these days? 
A lot of times you hear people just saying Scrum is Agile and Agile is Scrum. But are they really the same? And if you, if you scale it up, um, does that require just mil multiple instances of the Scrum process? Oh yeah, um, can, can across have Scrum of Scrums. Multiple teams with Scrum of Scrums indeed, and uh, a lot of stand-up meetings of all the people who are kind of extracts, and um, it lacks a lot of transparency, right? And uh, or does it really require a different process, a, a large-scale process that will fit to your large-scale company? And Agile was always about keeping it simple, right? And when I look at these pictures, I get the feeling like I'm not getting it. How is this simple? How is this context driven? How is this made, tailor made for your company? Um, so, um, tailor made for your company, you could also just copy oh, Spotify. Yes. Um, because that's basically what a lot of companies do, right? Is anybody of you doing the Spotify model? Oh, there are a few already, right? And are, are you working at Spotify? <laughs> Who of you is working at Spotify? You are? No, you aren't, right? Uh, so Spotify was created, and a lot of people don't know this, it was created when Spotify was growing eight times each year. And it happened for 10 years in a row. So when you grow 800% of last year, then you need a very different environment with very different teams. Who is in a Spotify company, a Spotify model company, who's also growing eight times? per year. That's Nobody crazy, could. right? Spotify had a, um, a ratio of every person had half a manager, if you count it down. What, half a manager? So every two people had one manager. That was the oh. ratio in, in Spotify. So what you see when, when you do a Spotify implementation is that you get a lot of managers. Because you are in a guild and you are in a chapter and you are in a tribe. And mostly, if your company is more stable and not growing eight times every year, you don't need so many managers on board. You can actually handle things on your own. You don't need to onboard 800% of the people who are working there every year. You don't need to guard a culture so much. And what you see is when you copy Spotify, mostly that's the idea of the management. So we keep the managers. Oh, yeah. I have never seen a Spotify implementation which also removed all the managers in all the layers. So basically, it's even worse. The ratio in a Spotify company is worse than one to two. That's terrible, right? So we're definitely going to keep this. Um, so we're going to do the big flow framework. Short is BFF. And we see a lot of traffic already on it, um, mostly on the, on, the, on the social media. And um, uh, BFF in the future will be called uh, version 3.0 yes. because we have management 3.0, sociocracy 3.0, and everything just starts at 3.0 these days. Um, and we're going to have release planes. Instead because, of release trains, right? Yes, because they go faster and we're now airborne. So that really shows maturity. Um, and we're going to, similarly to SAFE, we're going to add a layer of complexity every year. Oh, good. Because then we can do certification every year. So you just fall out of certification if you don't recertify for BFF. Then you're not my BFF anymore, right? Makes sense. Um, so, and um, yes, we're going to copy Spotify. Yes. So, what else? Who doesn't, right? Oh, um, we need to talk about tooling too, right? You all use a lot of tooling in your projects, right? Um, you probably have uh, uh, an environment to write code in, and uh, lots of other stuff that make it really, really nice. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the things that we make mandatory in Flow. So in Flow, you need to have boards, right? Everybody has boards, usually with post-its on it, or other sorts of papers and graphs and ideas on it. Um, so yes, we're going to have lots of boards. But in addition to having a board, we'll need to actually make it so complex that nobody understands what on it anymore, what's on it anymore. So if you set up a board, let's say in Jira or in Trello or in any tool, you need to have at least 20 columns, right? Because that makes sure that nobody understands where you actually are in your work. And by the way, you need to have so many boards in there to show all the progress and the graphs that you need a separate room to pull all these boards into so that you can walk into the room and you can see immediately what the status is. And we found a name for that. We'll call it the board room. Because that's where all the important things take place anyway, right? So one of the tools that we actually think everybody should do is a tool called Jira. You use it too, right? 
it's basically mandatory. Actually, a lot of people say, oh, we're doing Agile because we have Jira. Or we do Jira, so we are Agile. I've seen managers actually say this, right? This is not uh, something I made up. So we think, you know what? Um, this becomes mandatory. So everybody who does Flow should use Jira as well. And we need to find a way to deal with Atlassian, the owners of Jira, to, so we can make some money from them as well if we sort of recommend or make mandatory this Jira tooling, right? Uh, by the way, if you use Jira, nobody really understands who uses Jira. They have like a Scrum board or a Kanban board. They're actually quite the same. The differences between the two are so little that I never found out why they have both of them. So in Flow, you just have both of them. And you keep them both in sync using all these work items being epics and stories and tasks and whatever you can come up with to put on the board. And you make the process so complex that nobody understands it anymore anyway, right? So that's why we say this. We say, well, basically, um, besides having Jira, you need to track your progress. Now, in Agile Project, and I've shown you these before, we use burn down charts. The only problem is, if you do a flow project that fails anyway, you don't have any real progress. So instead of saying, I have a burn down chart, we're just going to say, we'll have a burn chart. Because basically, the idea is you burn a lot of money, and you don't make any progress. By the way, this is an actual graph from an actual project, by the way. If you look at the two lines in there, it's that the, the purple one is the story points remaining right, over time. Right. Do you see any difference in there? Well, it grows, actually. And the green one is basically the number of ones that we resolved. So we did a lot of work, but the number of points that we still need to do didn't get less. It got more. So this is basically a way to spend money. Eventually, over time, you will have spent so much money, and the only result is that you will have even more work. So that's guaranteed work for the rest of your life. Who doesn't want that? It's cool, right? This is a great invention, I think. Right, Jim, this is a great invention. Let's have some more. Right, oh, um, oh about communication. Um, so we are all developers. We basically don't really like to communicate. So what happens is they put us in these open floor plans. Are you in an open floor plan trying to do some work? Can you manage that? I can't, basically. I, I have trouble finding my way. So if you want people to not work, put them in an open floor plan. They will be distracted all of the time. That is even outside of all these stupid Slack messages that come up all the time, right? So if you put them in an open floor plan, and there's research being done, right? So tell this to your boss, saying that, yes, your office open floor plan is ruining your productivity. There's actual research that says open floor plans don't really work. And they're usually put there to save space, right? Because less space makes the building you need smaller, means you have less rent, so et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. And even one time, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I had that to was be, scary. <laughs> I entered the building at the, at the ground floor. We went up to the second floor. We walked a full path. We went down to the, fir to the base floor again. So I asked, like, why did we not just cross beneath? And the answer was, well, the second floor is good for recruitment because it's our most beautiful looking open floor plan. So somehow you just became your company's brochure, right? For recruitment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This looks nice on your brochure. That's true. Yeah. Right? If you have a brochure, everybody wants to work in a place like this, right? Looks nice. If you really get down to where people are working, it's usually the basement or something. So anyway, so um, about communication, um, we figured out that um, we, want, we don't want people to communicate, right? Because communication, well, they might learn something from the other people, right, in the room. So what we thought of is that since everybody's in an open floor plan anyway, we might as well give them all noise cancellation headphones. Because that way, we're pretty sure that they never communicate with each other again. It works, by the way. I have, my previous team was a team full of developers who all were... Um, noise cancellation headphones. It was impossible to communicate, right? So if I had a question, I want to pose it, I couldn't ask them directly because they were like, lo, 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 lo. nobody answered, right? You could shout and nobody answered. So that's good. By the way, if you want to become a flow resource, you need to get a tattoo on your arm. So if you don't have a tattoo already, there's a tattoo shop nearby. We pass one on the way, right? So get your tattoo and maybe make a flow tattoo out of it too, right? So anyway. 
Um, so what's the next thing? Yes, oh yeah, well, in the next version of Flow, we also tried experimenting with uh, augmented and virtual reality. Really, really cool, except that if you wear these glasses, it's impossible to see the code on your screen, right? So that doesn't really, it didn't really add value. And then we thought, well, if everybody's wearing these headphones already, how can they communicate? Well, there is a, one solution to that, the perfect solution, it's called Slack. Do you like Slack? I, 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 I really don't, right? I never find my way. There's like 10,000 channels that, that pop up messages on my screen all the time. So if you really want to be bugged all the time, so I have this guy sitting next to me, he's a software architect, and he has these notifications from Slack, and they come up like every two minutes. If I have a conversation with him, I'm like, yeah, you know, Wouter, it's like, blah, blah, and he's like, huh, what? And then you say, yeah, well, I mean this, huh, what? He's checking these messages all the time. Don't you all do that? So, well, yes, these notifications, they become mandatory, right? And you need to stay in flow, so you need to do it all the time. So if you want to communicate, even with the people sitting next to you, you have to send them a Slack message. There's no other way to do that. So we are going to do Slack all the time. We also invented a new technique, which we call pair slacking, which replaces pair programming. You just copy some of your code, put it on Slack. The other one can pick it off. They can look at it too and send you some code back. I've actually seen people do this on my team. And they were sitting opposite to each other, right? They might as well sit at the same computer, and they don't anymore. They just go to Slack and send each other messages. Even in my own team, people are sending them each other Slack messages while they're actually sitting just all together. So this is good to actually stop being uh, um, doing any productivity. And then we figured out, you know what we could do? So every release, or every, maybe even every check-in you have, there needs to be a separate channel on Slack that monitors that particular resource. Actually, we thought about, you know, all the feedback from our pipelines could also go into Slack, so you get even more messages on Slack anyway. Does that make sense? It does, right? Oh, and by the way, um, if you have agile coaches, they usually run out of things to do anyway, eventually, because nobody wants to be coached anymore. We figured out they could actually act as the threat police. Um, we have agile coaches in companies that actually look into Slack and they answer every message everywhere. And they always say if you answer something, no, no, you shouldn't do that on the main thread. You should do it in a separate thread. That's what agile coaches do at companies we work for, right? So, yeah, I think we should have Slack, right? So I think there's something important missing. Can you guess what it is? Yeah, I can guess. Yeah, you, but you did it before. Oh. <laughs> It's manifestos. Yes. <laughs> because, um, well, first of all, there were some historical great manifestos. And a manifesto is a published verbal declaration of the intentions, motives, or views of the issuer. And there was, for instance, the Communist Manifesto, which was a lengthy document. Which is this one, right? Yes, this is handwritten by Karl Marx, right? So oh. what happened is that people actually expressed all their thoughts, all their, all their um, uh, requisite. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all the things they were thinking about, all their intentions, to actually properly explain what they are heading for. What's their vision, right? So um, if you look at the history of technical manifestos, there was this point where somebody thought, yes, I want to write a manifesto because I have very clear intentions, very clear vision. And the first one was the, the GNU project. And right. it was about software freedom. So software should be free for anybody to use. And software should be made by anybody because that's the way we are sustainable in the end as, as the world, right? So, um, and then came the Hacker Manifesto, which had kind of similar intentions, just a different way of executing it. Um, and then came the Agile Manifesto. We all know this one, right? And after that, these are less, um, well, important maybe, but also less known, the, the Software Craftsman Manifesto, the Agile HR Manifesto, and also the Rocked Manifesto about security. So if you look at the Agile Manifesto, at least it had pages, although most of the people only know the first page anymore, right? Because it actually has also a lot of principles on the next pages. Um, but mostly we know this one. And what I mostly hear is, yes, we don't do documentation because uh, documentation is over here and we only do these things. And it says here, while there is value on the items of the right, we value the items on the left more. That's kind of an important sentence that was kind of made to be in there, right? 
And um, if you look at all the manifestos after the Agile manifesto, they just have the four lines because that's really easy to write. And people actually read this, right? So this is the Software Craftsman manifesto and this um, is the a Agile HR manifesto. And there is nothing more than this. It's like a one pager. And then there came this one, oh, the yeah. program. my favorite. <laughs> Motherfucker, do you speak it manifesto? Which is about, um, basically, we are a, com uh, a community of motherfucking programmers who are, are, have been humili humiliated by software development yes. methodologies for years. Oh, you can write, read yeah, it better there, right? Well. <laughs> so we're tired of all the methodologies, and we actually want to start programming again. And um, basically, this one really resonates with him. He has a t-shirt about really? it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I have this t-shirt, yes. <laughs> you have this t-shirt. So we definitely want our own manifesto. So it's the Flow Manifesto. And what we want is extensive certification over hands-on experience. Yes. Yes. And we so want to copy methodologies over thinking for yourself. Because who wants to think for themselves, right? That's really hard. Copying is so much easier. Yes. And tool-driven confusion over building working software. Yeah. And we also want like endless meetings over individual flow and mandatory gamification over authentic uh, autonomy. And, while, and, and just to be clear about it, uh, while we ignore the things on the right, we do the things on the left. <laughs> so there's, there's no hesitation anymore, right? Yeah. And, and definitely we thought about it and we're going to follow the trend. So uh, right now it's a manifesto, but um, it's we're so going small. Right? To call it a microfesto because it's just one page. <laughs> and it really resonates right? with microservices. Yeah, cool. So, um, and then we thought about how can we make money out of this new approach? Well, where is the money? The money is in certification, right? So we thought, you know what? We can have everybody certified, and that makes us a lot of money. So we've been thinking about this, and we were like, yeah, well, um, well, we need to make money too, right? If you do Scrum, there's like tons of different certifications. There's like a million and one Agile certifications. So why not have one ourselves too? So you need to do um, a multiple choice exam, right? Uh, but because we want to make it easy, um, we're not going to make it really, really hard, right? So first of all, if you look at master, true mastery, right? Everybody wants to become a Scrum master. Now, if you do something like karate, for instance, so Kim here um, has done a lot of karate, actually. She was a former Dutch champion, basically. So how many years of practice does that take you to, do, to become a master in karate? Well, the golden rule is like 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. I did train like 20 hours per week for a lot of years. Yeah. What? Yeah. 20 hours per week for 10 years? So how long do you have to train to become a scrum master? It's a two-day course. Yeah, one day is good too, but it's a two-day course. And then you become a certified Scrum Master. So we have lowered our fence so much that we allow everybody to come into the field. That's why nobody's talking about coding anymore these days, right? It's because everybody, whether you are a history teacher or a tourist guide, everybody can come into the field and coach teams to develop software. Isn't that good? No, it's not, right? No. Sorry, it's not good. So, certification, yes. So, yes, you can become a certified flow resource. It's the only one we'll have. We don't do project management res uh, certification. But, so in these courses, what we'll do is, first of all, we'll learn you how to rip off post-its for my blog properly, because that's really, really important. And there are good rules to that, basically. I can teach you. You'll learn how to move items on a Jira board, which is fundamental to doing flow right. We also learn you how to decorate your workplace. So we bring all these nice stuff into the office and you can put it on the walls. And oh yeah, by the way, there need to be some training courses. But you know what we thought? A two-day course? Too long. Nobody has the proper set of mind anymore to do a two-day training course. So one day maybe? So what about a one hour? So this is about the total length of the course. So you've now done the course basically. Isn't that good? So that means we're going to have the certification right now. Are you okay with that? So there's three questions you need to answer it right. So please note for yourselves the right answers to these questions, right? Are you going to do the first one? Uh, oh, yes, sure. Okay, so what roles do we have in Flow? We have managers, project managers, and product owners. Or we are all one team. Blech. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, lots and lots, except for testers, of yes. course, because we're only going to test in production. We have users Nobody likes for this. testers anyway, no. right? No. <laughs> Boring. And we have resources. Resources. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, 
Note it down so we can get to the second question. So the second question is, what's the goal of having retrospectives in Flow? A, to interrupt the daily flow of our resources. B, to endlessly discuss why the resources in our project should work harder. Three, C, to make sure we spend two days preparing demos. You all do that, right? So that's good. D, to watch the demos fail together with our clients. Yes. So pick the right answer, so we'll go to the third and last it's, question. It's hard, right? But do pick an answer, because you have better chance if you pick one, right? And, and then the last question. Um, we have certification in Flow because we want well-trained resources in our project. Uh. Or it makes our methodology look important. It does. Um, flow is so complicated, you need lots of training to become an expert. Or we want to make money. Yes. Oh, sorry. I made that. So yes, did you all figure out what are the right answers? Um, so um, we're going to show you the results now. And basically, yes, all the answers were right. That means you are now all certified. And just to make it easy, we've put a certificate up on the screen. So you can make a picture of it, and you can put it on your resume. And uh, we'll leave it up here for a few seconds. Um, so you're basically the fourth group of people now. So we have now like 2,000 certified flow resources already in the field. And people actually have been asking us to put up the website, to put up the Flow Manifesto. So we'll do that somewhere in the next weeks, I guess. Um, so you, we, we, we'll put the slide decks available so you can get the certificate anyway. Uh, uh, so if you've all taken a picture, we'll move on a bit right now. Oh, by the way, um, to make sure everybody stays certified, you have to pay us 200 euro every year. That's true, right? Yeah. So. Let's talk about what we really think, right? Oh, maybe it's about time. We have five minutes left. Yeah? Shall I do the first one? Yes. OK. So here's what we really, really, really believe, right? We believe that software is made by people. So it's not a particular process to follow. It's not a particular framework that makes it successful. So whether you do Scrum, Spotify, Save, XP, Kanban, whatever you do, it's you that writes the software, right? It's you that makes the better code. So think about it. It's about you. So it has to be, you have to work in a way that suits you the best, right? Yes. And also, we believe that every organization or team will create and evolve an approach that fits them best. And it's really hard because you have to think about it. You have to adapt it to your own context. But if you do this, you get an approach that actually fits the thing you are doing with the people you are doing and in the competition you are doing it. So I really like this tweet where it said, I think that only the most insided folks will appreciate the signif significance of saying that Scrum doesn't say you have to do Scrum. That was cool, because I asked James if I could use the, the tweet, and he said, well, only if you truly understand it. That's typical for James, yes? That's kind of the <laughs> I same, <know> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so the next thing is, yes, communication is key. That means face-to-face -face communication beats any other type of communication. Slack is nice. Skype calls are, no, they're not nice. Uh, meetings, mm, OK, but true one 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 face-to-face communication is the stuff that actually is the real deal, right? So if you want to work together with people, make sure you just communicate with them. Really communicate to them instead of sending them a message on whatever medium or email. That's even worse, right? Communicate, please, face-to-face. -face. That's what works. Yes. And um, trust and personal safety is key. Um, so basically, if you every time have kind of the red and, uh, sprint anti-pattern, for instance, it's hurtful for people because you're telling them every two weeks that they are not doing their jobs properly. And these people are professionals, and these people work very, very hard and are very engaged and involved in the project. So um, show them that you trust them. Show them that you value them. And stop hurting people when they go home with a bad feeling because because every time, in every retrospective, you're saying, we did not do our jobs properly. Look beneath it. Look what they are adding. So make sure people feel safe to learn, feel safe to, to grow. True, true. And the next thing is, writing software is the hardest job in the world, right? There is no more complex work than doing software development. That's basically what it is. And it's becoming so complex because the, 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 the enormous diverging amount of technologies and ideas that we tend to use in this field, they're becoming too big to manage on our own. So that means actually to write good code, it requires concentration. It requires focus. 
So that means we should stop going to 30 meetings in a day, right? Most of the people on my teams, actually, if you look at their agendas, it's just horrible. They have like four or five meetings every day, and they don't know how to say no to them. And I think they should, right? They should say no a lot more to all these silly meetings that they tend to go to, right? So yes, a stand-up meeting is good. Yes, a retrospective every two weeks is good. Not preparing a demo for two weeks is even better. Just do the demo as it is and stop going to these senseless meetings all the time, right? Do the job we need to do. Yeah. And the way we write software changes every day. So we need to learn every day. And things are changing faster and faster. And you hear a lot of new methodologies, a lot of new software uh, languages. And you need to constantly be able to, to get some time to actually get them into your system. So, and continuous learning is essential. And it's, um, it's really something that people should be coached on and should also have, people should have time to actually do this. So don't let the urgent beat the important all the time. And make sure that there's time and there's coaching on learning. True. And in the end, what you will see is that you will become more and more self-organizing, more and more autonomous, meaning it's your job, so you should make most of the decisions, right? It's not the manager sitting at some desk 14 floors up in your building because he doesn't know the difference between Eclipse and IntelliJ. So if he has to make a choice about what database to use, you should make that decision. If you want to use MongoDB instead of what was it again that we had at the insurance company? Uh, DB2, yeah. right? So we tried to replace MongoDB by DB2. We had to convince the fucking CEO to do that. It took me almost two years to convince him. That's just stupid. It's a waste of time. We should make those decisions, right? Yeah, and to support that, uh, organizations need to be as flat as possible with as little hierarchy as possible. Because if you move to a very flat organization, you get the people who do the job to actually be responsible and to take the decisions on the things that are important for their jobs. So you get a very clear alignment and will lose a lot of overhead. And it's really the better place to be in. Oh, yeah, and it like also adds to trust. And cut down all of the middle management, yeah. right? That saves a lot of money, to, 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 by the way. So anyway, and the last thing is, is that, well, it's almost the last thing, is that, yes, experience does matter, right? Yes, I've been writing code for over 30 years. Yes, I still improve, right? I've learned a lot of ways about, about how to write better code, even in the last two to three years. And it never stops, which is pretty cool, right? And all this experience helps to write better code. And I can help other people write better code, hopefully, and, and use this experience in your teams, right? And learn all the time. True? Very. And, and the last thing is, never forget to have fun. Because yes. that's, what, what, that's what we're doing here, right? Yes. That's why I'm in this industry. I, I, because it's the best industry to be in, right? I wouldn't want to be in any other industry. Definitely. Right. Yes. So we're through. That's it, basically. Uh, we'll be here for the rest of the day for any questions. You can find the, um, the handouts and the slide decks for this talk here and for other talks as well. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Sander and Kim, thank you very much. That was a most entertaining talk.